1975 to 1985 was the most exciting period in camera design and advancement. Manufacturers were bringing out new technology every month. In 1981, Minolta came out with the model X700. That same camera would remain in continuous production right up to the end of the Minolta company 20 years later. What happened? Hello, I'm Mr. Gibson Guy, and today we are going in search of a very important Minolta camera that never happened. In 1985, Minolta announced ending development of manual focus cameras to concentrate on their new line of Maxim autofocus cameras. Actually, manual camera research ended right after the X700 appeared in favor of the coming Maxim line. We got the X570 and then the X370. They were just stripped down X700s, but nothing new in manual focus anyway. That will mark the end of manual focus Minolta's. At some time around 1980-81, Minolta executives must have contemplated what would follow the X700. No one seems to know, but you and I know that was as hot a subject as the XG7 being developed into the XG9. So let's take a big step back in time so we can take a small glance forward into the then near future, the new Minolta X900. The XG9 was an XG7 that had corrected the shortcomings of the XG7. The 9 got a depth of field preview button, multi-exposure capability, aperture direct readout window, full metered manual rather than unmetered manual, acute mate bright screen, and all the other goodies, but by 1980, new technology was making the 9 start to look dated. Minolta XG series cameras had been widely popular, but the company's best offerings were still to come. Olympus had perfected the, uh, the science of measuring a flash unit's output off the film plane with their amazing OM2, but at this point, their exclusive contract agreement, ironically with Minolta, was expiring. Now other manufacturers were hot to jump in. 1980 saw off the film flash metering on the Nikon F3 and the Contax Yashica RTS 137 and 139. Minolta had first developed this technology but licensed it to Olympus. In 1981, it finally featured prominently on the Minolta X700, and that would be this. The Minolta Auto 280PX with all its flash contacts, which would give through the lens flash metering on the X700. Minolta had shied away from the bulk of big heavy motor drives in favor of small lightweight auto winders like this auto winder D which goes on an XD11. Just as simple as that and it's all attached. Ta-da! But they could not compete with the brawny motor drive of the mighty Canon A1. Why have that little tiny thing when you can have this great big monster here hanging below your camera with 12 AA batteries weighing it down and bring that motor up to 5 frames per second at 18 volts of power. Minolta responded with a handy one-piece MD1 unit. Oh, this is light. Of course, it doesn't have the eight batteries in it that make it heavier. But, very simple to attach. And with just eight cells, we would give you three and a half frames per second top speed for the winder. Put that there. 
It was similar to the Nikon MD11, MD12 in being one piece, not separate battery compartments. <clears throat> Minolta had introduced program auto exposure way back on the XD11 before the Canon A1, but never used the word program until the X700. The XD11s had it. The later ones had a green 125th on it, but this is an early one, so there was no indication for using that to get full program on that. With the X700, the users got the P setting for program and the A setting for auto automatic. The A1 gave you green numbers and a green A to stop the camera down at for the early program cameras. The X700 was based on the XG platform but beefed up for the torque of a 12 triple volt motor drive. So the XG7 was not a very tough camera when they came out with the X700, they kind of improved it, or tried to build up the parts they thought would wear down from the faster motor, more powerful motor. So the X700 was a major update and advancement from the XG9. But what would the next generation encompass? From 1981 up to 1985, the time of the autofocus revolution, camera designers concentrated on refinement. The OM2 grew into the OM2 SP. Right here. Very similar, but actually the S2 SP was based on the OM4 rather than the OM2, but they called it an S because it had featured spot metering and some not battery dependent shutter speeds. And the Nikon FM2 right here, featured a new shutter. The Nikon was not new to the metal shutter curtain. But this particular one, a vertically traveling titanium curtains that range from four seconds to one four thousandth of a second. So they came up with that new titanium blade vertical shutter that increased speed possibilities considerably. And it was supposed to be tougher. Ironically, that one you just saw is currently not working. Pentax finally heard, was finally heard from with their excellent LX for their 60th anniversary. The letters LX are the Roman numerals for the number 60. And this offering showed off significant improvements in weather sealing and also joined the Canon new F1 with mechanical speeds from 1 60th to 1 2,000th to what were otherwise electronically controlled cameras. But these will shoot in manual without the battery, but without metering, of course. But your 1 60th to 1 2,000th will work without batteries, just no meter. And then finally, Olympus, with their OM4T, look at that shining in the sunlight there, came out with their incredible flash sync of one two thousandth of a second. But it wasn't actually in the camera, but rather it was a modification to the flash unit that they used. Nikon, oh, and of course both Olympus and Nikon jumped on the titanium body train. Titanium, the anti-plastic alternative. Both Olympus 
and Nikon uh, began to recognize there was a great deal of resistance from certain photographers to the expanded use of more and more and more plastics in place of metal on cameras. Some people really wanted metal cameras rather than plastic, although brass was not that great of a metal because it easily dented. But with, uh, for example, the OM4TI, uh, there was a number of titaniums from early on from Nikon, but with the OM4TI, they came out with titanium for the top, titanium for the base plate, titanium around the lens mount, and a lot of people say titanium for the film door. That is kind of a mixed reviews. But what n I never agreed with was with all that titanium, they're still using a cloth shutter, a horizontal traveling cloth shutter at that. Well, apparently on Olympus knew what they were doing with it, even though I disagree with using cotton for shutters. But with the OM4T, it came their incredible flash sync speed of one two thousandth of a second. The uh, first FM2 would flash sync at one two hundredth of a second, and everybody thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Subsequently, the uh, they improved the shutter in the FM2N and the FM FE2 would sync at 1 250th of a second. But the OM4 would sync at 1 2000th of a second. Just amazing. So, uh, where, oh, here. So, what were the specs of our hypothetical X900 Pro camera? Titanium, vertical shutter, flash sync at all speeds, spot metering, center weighted metering, wide area metering, you have choices for all those different patterns, mechanical shutter speeds, let's have more than just one of them, premium components replacing that flux capacitor that is the the bane of anyone interested in using an X700 these days. They could have used some better stuff. Um, more improved weather sealing, weatherproofing, and titanium top, bottom, and lens mount and back for the camera. Con considering all those modifications, it could have happened. It was happening in other cameras, and Minolta could have done it too. But, and it would have been their greatest camera ever. But they were concentrating on Maxims and they took that excellent X700 platform and just stayed with it, didn't do anything that could have happened. That evolutionary change updating could have made the X900 the greatest Minolta camera of all time. Well, I hope you find this interesting. Uh, leave me a comment if you enjoyed the video. Give us a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe if you haven't become a subscriber already. And I'd just like to add new people to the channel every day. So, that was our look at the non-existent Minolta X900. Boy, I wish I could see one. But I have to settle for an OM4T. This is Mr. Gibson Guy, and I'll see you on the next one.